Okay, so we will start with a famous guy. I mean, Jeremy O'Brien is with us now, I think. I hope I'm going to see his face. And Jeremy is the famous co-founder of C-Quantum. It's a company who has a very broad ambitions. He wants to create right away, I would say, a, a one million qubit system based on the photons. On top of that, he raised a couple million dollars. Uh, he will explain that. And since we are part of the ecosystem track of this conference, uh, we won't necessarily have a technical discussion. We will more focus on uh, what, were, what was the story of the company, how was it created, and why did it raise so much uh, money, and uh, how will it reach its ambition. Jeremy, it's up to you to do uh, some uh, preliminary remarks, and then we have probably a lot of questions for you. Hi, hello. Hi, Olivia. How are you? We're fine. Where are you? I, I'm in France, yes. I'm ah, actually okay. The, uh, Triumph, uh, but I took this photo uh, last time I was here in, in uh, Paris. In so no time zone problem, no jet lag. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Good. Exactly. Go, you can go. Okay, super. Well, uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, Olivia. Um, my name's uh, Jeremy O'Brien, and I'm one of, uh, one of the four co-founders and the CEO of uh, PsyQuantum. Um, I'm very delighted to be here in, in, in France, and I, uh, I really just wish that we could all be together in Paris in person, but uh, hopefully that will, uh, that will happen um, in, in the near future for all of us. Um, so PsyQuantum is a uh, four-year-old uh, quantum computing company based in, in Palo Alto in California. And I'm really excited uh, to be here today uh, to tell you, as Olivia says, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, PsyQuantum's uh, journey. <clears throat> so I've been asked to just, uh, you know, tell you a little bit about that uh, trajectory that got us here and, uh, you know, how we, uh, how we are uh, soon to build, uh, you know, a global company that uh, that's to create the world's first useful uh, universal quantum computer. And before I get into the detail of that, um, I, I just want to highlight that this has really been a very long uh, journey um, uh, for both me and uh, my co-founders uh, that, that spans back many decades uh, before the company uh, even, even started. Uh, and along that, along that, uh, you know, couple of decades uh, journey up to the founding of the company, um, there were quite a few uh, few breakthroughs, um, uh, and I'll, I'll sketch uh, a few of those. Um, but yeah, the four of us, we were all uh, professors of, uh, of physics and electrical engineering for, I guess, up to 20 years each uh, here in Europe before we we founded the company. And for me, uh, it it began that journey back in um, uh, back in 1995, when I first read about the uh, the idea that quantum computing could bring about a revolution comparable to the agricultural, industrial, and digital revolutions, uh, and be used to tackle some of the most you know pressing problems that that humanity uh, faced, and I, I I spent the next uh, five or six years working on uh, you know, quite a few different uh, approaches and quite a few different aspects of uh, various matter-based uh, approaches to qubits and, uh, and quantum computing. So when I say matter-based, I, I mean encoding in, uh, in electrons. And around about uh, the, the year 2000, so around the turn of the, turn of the century, which makes me feel very old to have to say that, turn of the millennium even, um, I, I had reached a kind of crisis point because I could not see a path to the million qubits that was uh, known even back then uh, to be required uh, for, for useful quantum computing. And I'd spend a lot of time thinking about how we could harness the uh, existing semiconductor industry to do that. And I could see no such, uh, such path. And just as, as I was at the uh, height, of, height of that crisis, um, uh, photonic quantum computing really arrived on the scene uh, thanks to a, a paper by uh, three of my colleagues, Manny Canil, Ray Laflamme, and uh, Jared Milburn. 
And in that seminal paper, uh, they gave hope for uh, photonic or optical or light-based, whichever you'd like to refer to it as. I'll talk about photonic quantum computing, but same, same thing, optical. Um, and what they showed is that in principle, you could build a large scale error corrected quantum computer using just single photon sources, single photon detectors and all <clears throat> linear optical networks. But despite proving this possibility, um, the paper also really showed that it was completely uh, impractical uh, to do so uh, for you know, one reason um, being that you know, there was an immense uh, overhead in the components that would be required to build that system, which would have meant that uh, you know, building a, a large scale quantum computer according to that original Canil de Flam and Milburn recipe uh, would have resulted in a system the size of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, which is our favorite uh, mountain range in, 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 uh, in the Bay Area in California. So that's about 26,000 uh, square miles. And so at this point, I would say after a brief moment of enthusiasm, most of the world really wrote off uh, optical quantum computing and went back to focusing on, on, on those matter-based approaches that I myself had been working on for some time. And we, we, however, the four of us who founded this company, we were emboldened uh, rather than deterred by that Canil, the Flaman Milburn paper. Um, and, and, and together, the four of us, as well as separately, spent the next 15 years uh, sort of chipping away at that, uh, at that overhead, reducing it, inventing uh, brand new architectures um, uh, in the hope of making photonic quantum computing practical. And the reason that we did that was because we knew that if that overhead problem uh, could be solved, then the benefits of a light-based approach to quantum computing over a matter-based approach uh, would lead to uh, useful quantum computing uh, um, much faster. And those advantages are, of course, uh, you know, incredibly low noise. Uh, so photons are massless particles. And so they effectively don't uh, experience heat. And so they have intrinsically uh, very low noise systems. My co-founder Terry likes to point out that you can look into the sky and see a photon that was born 10 billion years ago and is still polarized. So 10 billion years is therefore a, uh, a lower bound on the intrinsic lifetime of these systems. Uh, they of course have the advantage of high speed in transmission, but also in, in measurement, uh, which is very helpful for um, uh, for error correction, in fact. Uh, and, and the big one I would say was, was manufacturability. And so during that uh, 15 year period, the team managed to solve um, you know, issues around generating entanglement with uh, photons, uh, making functional qubits, uh, logic gates, including on a chip, small scale algorithms and so on. And in parallel with that uh, hardware work, we also managed to improve the, the architecture uh, and the resultant uh, overhead by several orders of magnitude. And so what started out as the size of the Sierra, uh, Sierra Nevada mountain range uh, was now the size of Palo Alto, another favorite place for us uh, in, in Silicon Valley. So that's 26 square miles instead of 26,000 square miles, just to give you a sense of the, the improvements that were made. Now that was obviously tremendous progress, but there was still uh, a long way to go. and. Um, we were nevertheless confident that that we were on a on a trajectory uh, to get there, and so in a, in a, in two, 2015, um, we 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 made a, a couple of uh, really important uh, breakthroughs that really changed the game and and motivated us to leave uh, our academic worlds and and move to Silicon Valley and start Psyquantum. And the, the, the first breakthrough was that we came up with an architecture that was uh, naturally uh, planar. So it was naturally two dimensional and not uh, three or more dimensional, you know, squashed into a plane or physically three dimensional, but it was actually intrinsically two dimensional. And you can appreciate by analogy with the conventional computer, uh, computer industry, just how important that was. It was really our ability to, to 2D print computer chips that led to the Intel 4004 in uh, 1971 and everything that we've seen since. So that was super important. But I would say the thing that took 
uh, photonic quantum computing uh, from being possible to being practical more than anything else was the second breakthrough, which is that we figured out an architecture uh, that was a fixed optical depth. So all I mean by that is that this is an architecture where each photon travels a fixed microscopic distance through a fixed small number of components, no matter how big a quantum computer uh, that you build. So that was, that was super important. And the final piece to the puzzle that really, uh, that really inspired us to, to go and, uh, and build this system was that all of the components in that architecture had already been fabricated in uh, CMOS compatible ways. And so uh, the four of us, um, we left academia. Uh, we, we spurned what was then conventional wisdom about what it would take to build a useful quantum computer. And we started uh, this company, PsyQuantum. And um, when we started uh, this company, we, we made a, a bet that was, I would say, profoundly differentiated from other quantum computing efforts. And, and that bet was, you know, not, not just for the sake of being contrarian, but was based on our combined 60 years uh, of experience in building and testing, uh, you know, small quantum systems in the lab, as well as uh, reconfiguring architecture, contributing to the theory and so on. Um, and, and understanding what, you know, what was really required uh, for error correction. And, you know, the bet was that uh, less ambitious, you know, noisy, small systems would not be able to uh, 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 run useful algorithms and that we would really need to get into this regime. So I'll, I'll just quickly attempt to, to share a slide with you, which, um, which shows you uh, the, that, that distinction here, if I can. I can manage it. Um, I cannot, so that's that's uh, that's fine. Um, in any case, uh, you, we made a bet on on the need for uh, error correction, and therefore the need for a million qubits, and therefore the need to be in a, a tier one uh, semiconductor chip foundry to manufacture that system. And I think, you know, back then. In 2015, um, there was a lot more momentum behind the what has become known as the NISC uh, era of machines. So, you know, systems with a hundred or a thousand uh, noisy, unerror corrected uh, qubits. And I think it was probably fair to say that, um, you know, to our to our detractors, uh, that decision at the time to shoot for the moon. Uh, as it were, looked looked kind of crazy um, because error correction, you know, requires, uh, you know, a million or more uh, qubits and, you know, to university professors uh, celebrating their first ever two qubit gate or small scale algorithm or something like that, a million uh, seemed to be uh, decades away, uh, if not totally impossible. Um, and hence a lot of uh, a lot of quantum computing efforts were, were, were indeed formed around um, targeting those uh, small, noisy uh, NISC type, uh, type prototypes. Jeremy, I think, I'm yes. going to ask you to speed up because we have tons of questions lining up for you. We don't want to lose that. So if you and wrap we have up only five your, minutes, five minutes left. Okay. So <clears throat> if you give us the uh, closing market and then I can come back with the question that we have for you. Thanks. Sure. Um, so, that, so what uh, emboldened us to, uh, to, to take that bet was really that we had a secret weapon and that was um, that, you know, we had figured out how to use the semiconductor manufacturing industry to, to deliver on this system. And of course, that is leveraging the, you know, 50 years and trillion dollars that went into that uh, system. And that's in contrast to uh, other approaches which re rely on, you know, either exotic materials and or extreme operating environments and or you know beyond state-of-the-art uh, manufacturing and so we figured out a way to to build a quantum computer in uh, an existing semiconductor fabrication process using existing components and if we hadn't done that we wouldn't have started a, a company and so we've staffed that company not with uh, experimental physicists and, and and tinkerers but rather with uh, experienced semiconductor engineers uh, who've spent their their lives building um, you know real products rather than doing science experiments uh, and we've also recruited uh, the world's foremost experts in uh, quantum error correction 
and uh, fault tolerance. And we have uh, we've forged a fantastic relationship with the global supply chain, uh, partnering with, with world leaders, including global foundries, uh, both in the US and in Europe, uh, as well as IMEC in Europe and Leti right here in, in France. And we're seeing performance that, that simply can't be achieved in those uh, smaller R&D oriented uh, fabs. And so in parallel with, with that, uh, we've made a huge progress in the design of our machine, and I won't go into the detail of that, but our architecture team uh, recently hit their X2 uh, major milestone, which uh, reduces the size of the machine by a factor of a million and uh, dramatically increases its tolerance to manufacturing imperfections. And so I'm obviously very proud of that uh, technical progress, which I, I don't have the time in this forum to go into detail on, but we've also made great commercial progress as well. And so we have a, a growing roster of uh, Fortune 500 customers from across the globe who are working hand in hand with our applications team to understand how our system uh, will be able to solve their problems. And we're seeing very encouraging evidence, for example, uh, that battery chemistry uh, could be solvable using our um, early machines. But we're also seeing uh, a lot of uh, enthusiasm and working with uh, customers across, uh, you know, automotive, aerospace, finance, healthcare, et cetera. So to, to, to wrap up, um, I think the way to understand PsyQuantum is that we made a, we made a very uh, different bet when we started this company. And that bet was that we could build a quantum computer in a, uh, in a small number of years um, using the same uh, global supply chain that's used to build uh, cell phones, laptops, and, and high performance computers already. And I have for at least 20 years had that, that is, that is a requirement. If we're not harnessing the semiconductor industry, then we, we won't have large scale error corrected and therefore useful quantum computing in my lifetime. From the outset, we focused on, on, on building that, uh, that million cubic quantum computer. We in very intentionally did not chase uh, intermediary NIST type milestones. And I would say that, you know, with each incremental qubit uh, uh, out there in the world, you know, that we can and should celebrate that progress, but we have always been convinced that if you want a useful quantum computer that can run meaningful applications, you really need fault tolerance, which means you need error correction and you, and you need to be in that, uh, in that um, million qubit regime. And I'm heartened to see uh, in the last months, an increasing chorus of, uh, of leaders in the, in the quantum industry echoing uh, that sentiment. Great. And a lot why don't I say. stop there? And, uh, yeah. and uh, I, I'm delighted to uh, answer any questions and also to, uh, to uh, engage with you through the networking around this fabulous event. Thanks a lot. I mean, we, we are so excited to actually ask a lot of technical questions, uh, no, but unfortunately we can't. So as business one well. <laughs> as business one too. But one, one thing that I will, uh, you know, not going to the details of Photonic that I'm sure a lot of questions already popping up, but let's go to the fact that this is a session that is about the ecosystem. So maybe I'd like to ask you, why going to US? Is it, is it really necessary for any startup, especially with such a big ambition as you were showing us, to start there? Or can you envision other ecosystem that is emerging that can enable such a uh, moonshotting, uh, as you were saying? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I hope you can detect that I'm an Australian citizen. I'm also a British citizen, and I regard myself consequently as a citizen of Europe. Um, and indeed, I am uh, for, for another uh, few weeks at least. Um, and I care very much about, uh, you know, innovation and, 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 and the future and so on. Uh, and I think, I, I wouldn't say that it's impossible uh, to do this uh, elsewhere, but I, you know, certainly Silicon Valley was a very good place to, uh, you know, raise the capital, uh, recruit the, uh, the workforce, you know, it's called Silicon Valley and we're building a silicon uh, quantum computer, as well as engage with uh, all of those folk in the supply chain. But, I would say we're now in a position where we've, um, you know, we've raised that capital, we've de-risked the the company to an extent where, you know, we're very interested in um, in uh, participating in in other ecosystems around the world and hope that we can be big contributors to them as well. Business. Okay, you have another business question. I have Olivia. a I have a business question. Uh, since you raised more than five hundred million bucks, people would be interested, I presume, to understand how you d did it. And one bias of the question: we did your investor. 
uh, I think you have many investors because you had a, a several series of uh, funding. Uh, did they have a specific profile that should be interesting to know for other startups who are trying to uh, r r get some funding? Yeah, I think um, the, the simple way to say it is that, you know, when, when investors uh, looked and, and, and did their technical diligence on what, the, on what we're doing, um, then it was a very compelling, um, was a very, very compelling prospect for them because, you know, essentially our position is that we uniquely have a path to the most profoundly world-changing technology uh, that's been uncovered to date, at least on any sort of human time or money scale. And so I think investors can see that tremendous upside uh, and they can also verify the, um, you know, that the, they can verify the, the, the technical path there. Uh, you know, they can deploy people from, uh, from all, all various different technical backgrounds to look into that. Um, so I think, uh, you know, to, to, to uh, yeah, I think, I think it, that, that maybe that hopefully helps answer the question. Okay. Maybe one last question, last you know, one. it's from the chat, uh, is that are you at the stage where your team can apply a quantum algorithms? Can you give us any timeline for when user can run the photonic quantum computer? Yeah, so we're, we, we, we intend that our first uh, quantum computer that, that will uh, be available to people uh, to run will be a million qubit uh, system. We have, we have previously in our, you know, academic research days, uh, you know, run all sorts of, you know, quantum chemistry algorithms, machine learning algorithms and so on. And I think there's no ambiguity that, uh, that all of that works. The ambiguity, and I think this is, this is for, the, for the entire field of quantum computing, can you get to a scale uh, to, to do something useful? And so that's been our, our uh, singular sort of focus is getting to that, getting to that scale. And so we are, you know, we're not making available uh, small scale systems for people to, to play with. I, I, the graphic that I was going to show um, was just, just really to highlight that we're, we, we're, we're bypassing this NISC era uh, entirely until such a time as uh, someone finds a compelling um, commercially relevant uh, application there, which so far no one has. Great. Me, as I said, we have plenty of more questions. Thanks a lot for joining. And as you said, hopefully next QCB, we will have you in present. So we're going Absolutely. to continue to the next session. Thanks a lot. Good to see you. Thank you all Bye -bye. very much. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.